Welcome to Sales and Marketing Talk Show. Today we are discussing brand and especially brand renewal. And, and I have Uri Ledergor joining me from Gong. And you guys just did a brand renewal. And it was kind of a big thing. So super happy to discuss that one today. And welcome to the show, Uri. How are you? Great, Sam. Thanks for having me. Excited to be talking today. Yeah, and this is super interesting topic and one thing that miners are always asking for is like real case studies rather than only theory so i think today today we have great discussion ahead of us and maybe shortly for people who don't know uh, you or gong can you give just a brief introduction to you and what gong is doing Sure. Um, so about me, um, I'm Udi. I'm originally from Tel Aviv, Israel. Uh, I lived there until three years ago and then uh, moved here to the San Francisco Bay Area to be with my team at Gong. Uh, we have a team in Tel Aviv that does engineering and our team here in San Francisco does sales, marketing and support. So uh, I moved here with my family. I've got a husband and three children. And uh, it's been uh, quite an interesting time being here, especially during COVID, uh, where the city has mostly been shut down. But it's, it is opening up now, which is uh, great. Uh, I've been at Gong for five years, and this is also the fifth marketing team that I have built. So I've been a VP of marketing five times, um, joined Gong five years ago. I'm now the chief marketing officer here. Uh, I have a team of 33 talented, funny, passionate marketers, which is absolutely fantastic. And um, let's see, what else did I miss? I think that's enough about me. Uh, I like playing the piano and drinking whiskey when I'm not doing marketing uh, to give something interesting on the side. Uh, as far as Gong, Gong is the leading revenue intelligence platform. We created that category a couple of years ago. Uh, we launched our first conversation intelligence product for sales about five years ago. And we are helping thousands of sales teams across the world at some of the biggest and smallest companies you might have heard of. Uh, better understand their reality. So we unlock reality to help customers understand their customers, their business, what's working and not working in their sales processes so they can improve that and sell more. Yeah, thanks for the intro. And I, I haven't personally used Gong yet. I actually had a demo from, from you and it was like super, super interesting. And I, I really like the things that it, it can help sales teams to do so. Super interesting awesome. company and would recommend others to check that one out. But firstly, before hopping into the rebranding itself and what, what did you do there? I think the big question is why? Like why you decided to do a brand renewal? Uh, that's a great question. So, you know, our last brand update was three and a half years ago in 2018. And at that time, Gong was at a very different stage of our business. We were a small startup. We were craving for attention and we wanted to do something that's so different and provocative that would just be like screaming from the rooftops, hey, look at us. And it worked. Uh, we, we went in a very different approach to what most B2B startups do. Uh, Danny from my team jokes that uh, there's a Series A blue that every startup who raises a Series A uses because it's a very safe color. So you'll see most of the B2B sites you open, they're blue, gray, and white. That's, that's what all of them look like. And we looked at all of them and said, okay, how can we be the exact opposite of that? So we went for bright pink and purple, and we got a crazy bulldog as our mascot, and we had all these crazy people on the website, and it worked. Everyone paid attention, and the brand has been growing at over 100% every year. So that was where we were three and a half years ago. Um, a few months ago, we stopped and looked at where we're going and we realized that we had outgrown our own brand. We're no longer a small startup. Uh, many of the Fortune 500 companies are now using Gong. We're selling not only to the small businesses, which are still a very important part of our business, but also to really large enterprises. And we didn't really look the part anymore. We looked like a crazy startup. And so we wanted to look the part that we really are and have the brand match our stage and the future growth of where we're going. So we decided to keep the bold edginess part of the brand. So we kept the colors, the pink, the purple, the, the kind of funky shaped logo, even though that's evolved as well. 
but we wanted to also look more mature and more sophisticated so that enterprise buyers would look at us and see, oh, that looks like a interesting, safe choice for my enterprise and not like some crazy startup that maybe is risky to buy from. So that, that was the, the impetus to, to evolve the brand the way, the way that we did. Yeah, sounds, sounds good. Sounds good. And I think like in the last couple of years, I think companies have really realized their like value of brand. But if we go back, let's say five or 10 years ago, I think there was still a lot of companies where like the value of brand wasn't like that big. So can you open up just shortly, like, does basically everyone in Gong realize the value of new brand or did you have to do a lot of selling to your founder, your CEO about, hey, now we need to do something new? No, not, not at all. Uh, it, it, was, it was very easy to get this done. Um, so a couple of things. First, I'll say our CEO, Amit Bendov, and, and my personal mentor, um, he was a chief marketing officer for many years before he became a CEO. And... That is a rare privilege to run marketing for a company where the CEO really gets marketing. So he can be a pain in the butt because he knows how to do this and can probably do it even better than I am. But it's also fantastic because he resources marketing and he values marketing. And I get a seat at the table and I meet with the board and I'm part of the executive leadership team. And so I get all the resources that I need to build this fantastic brand. I'm not asked to do something impossible. And to answer the second part of the question, yes, I think everyone at Gong understands the power of our brand. Um, just yesterday when we were training the sales team on, on how to use the new mission and value propositions that we brought out with the new brand, I was playing to them using Gong, uh, a part of a call from two days ago where a prospect came in, just asked for a demo on our website and said, hey, I saw your new brand and mission statement and I realized you're expanding to, to use cases like mine. So I wanna to talk to you now about bringing you into my sales team. That is the power of brand. When, when The biggest mistake I see around this is with CEOs who are very product focused and they think that if they build a product, everyone will come buy it and it will sell itself. That rarely works. That rarely works. And those companies are not growing as fast as Gong because Gong not only has the best product in the industry, which could almost sell itself, but also has the best brand in the industry. And those things together combined with a fantastic sales team and then a fantastic customer success team that really takes care of our customers, all these things increase awareness and increase the confidence of people that they're buying the best brand out there. And then of course the product and the customer success team create that raving fan experience for them that they want to stay and, and come back again. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that's a great, Great reminder for everyone that <laughs> it's not only about the great product, but you really need branding, selling, marketing, customer success, and all, all that one. But w when we talk about like branding and rebranding, I think typically people are thinking that it's the marketing department doing doing the work. And for sure, your marketing team had a big role on building your brand. And you mentioned was it you had thirty four people in in the marketing team, but did you use uh, any outside help for the rebranding process? And then you think like inside the Gong, like where everyone kind of part of the rebranding process as well. Absolutely. I, there's, a great, there's a great quote that I don't remember uh, who it's attributed to that says, your brand is way too important to leave it to marketing. And, and that's true. That's true. Uh, we are the, the stewards of marketing. We don't, the, the stewards of our brand. We don't own the brand. We can't create the brand. A brand is who you are. It's not what your website looks like. It's not what colors you choose for the logo. A brand is who you are as a company at, at Gong. We're, we're a company that stands for creating raving fans and providing the, the best products that help salespeople achieve their full potential. That is what we are as a brand. Marketing creates a visual identity around that and creates a messaging and narrative infrastructure around that. But we are the stewards of the brand. We, we, did, we can't create a brand. So that that's maybe another unrealistic expectation that some people have of marketing. They can't create your brand and make you something that you're not. You have to be something and then marketing can showcase that in the best way possible. To, to answer the second part of the question on the team that we used. So yes, externally, we, we work with a fantastic agency called Moving Brands. And they've helped companies like uh, Netflix and Asana and Google uh, do things like 
their logo and their branding. And, you know, even companies like Apple go to external agencies when they're doing a big rebrand or, or they need a big campaign because we do this probably every three years. There's no point in having a, an internal agency that could pull this off on their own and then be out of out of work uh, between those big rebrands. So it's better to go to, to an agency that does this a few times a year for different brands, work with them, get some exciting external perspective, and then the internal team finishes the project and, and rolls it out and then maintains it. So we definitely used an external agency. And then the final part of my answer would be internally, we wanted to make sure that we're not surprising anyone by just working on this for six months within marketing and then going, ta-da, here's our new brand. No, we involved a very broad leadership uh, group that we brought them in. We told them what the goal of this project was. This is going to help us go up market and be seen as a more enterprise ready brand. And then we got their input on brands and ideas that either they felt were part of the Gong brand or should not be part of the Gong brand. So we, that's how we started the process. And then over the course of a few months, we checked in with the executive leadership team and said, okay, here's where the mission is coming together and here's the value propositions. And then uh, a few weeks ago, we started uh, sharing internally prior to the big external launch. This is what the brand is going to look like. We got the last feedback and we, we incorporated some of it. And then, of course, everyone was really excited last week when we launched this to the world and hundreds of gongsters, that's what we call our employees, shared uh, the brand and how excited they are uh, with, with the world. So I, I will say, though, this was not designed by committee. I don't do design by committee because if you do that and you're trying to please everyone, then you get some Frankenstein brand that hopefully pleases anyone but doesn't excite anyone. So there was a very small core team that worked on the brand with incorporating feedback and checkpoints on the way, but not trying to please anyone. And, and I set expectations, even with the executive team. Look, um, this is this is a marketing project. I want your feedback. Uh, I hope you like it. But if I decide to go with purple and you, Ryan, like green, I'm not going to be able to please you. So let's just put that up front. And thankfully, they, they've been trusting me for five years with, with <laughs> Gong's brand. And uh, hopefully they, they all like this one as well. Yeah, sounds good. Sounds good. You you mentioned their uh, term marketing project, but do you think like, of course, when when you did the like branding a renewal, it, it is kind of a project that you are doing there. But but do you think that at the same time, like it, it's kind of ongoing work, like all the time, like kind of rebranding going like every month to come as well? Absolutely. Uh, a brand is a living thing. It's a living, breathing thing, and it evolves every day, just like our messaging. So I'll give a couple of examples. Um, when we did the last big launch, the previous big launch three and a half years ago, uh, part of our messaging at the time was that Gong adds science to the art of selling. And we wanted to visualize that point about adding science to the art of selling. So part of the visual brand was uh, these people holding these uh, like chemistry beakers with some weird purple liquid inside. And we thought that would be a, a fun way of, of visualizing science with salespeople. Now, a few months later, we decided uh, that we're cutting out the word science from our messaging because we realized that salespeople don't care about science. Their leaders don't care about science. They're all about closing deals. We need to speak their language, not, not about science. So we changed the words and we also changed the visuals. We cut out all those beakers that the people were holding and we replaced the images so that there's no more science um, in, in the website. So that was one, one example. Uh, another example is uh, two years ago, still with the same visual brand or, or the core of that visual brand, we changed our category from conversation intelligence to revenue intelligence, the new category that we launched. So most of the website copy had to change with that. We built new pages to explain what revenue intelligence is, and we weaved that into the copy of every page on the website. So you have to keep this alive, and, and uh, you can easily tell when a when a website is stale or a brand hasn't been updated in too long it just you can feel it that it's disconnected from from what the company is doing and what where the industry is at yeah exactly and i think the science is a great example for example if i think of me i'm head of sales and probably 
science isn't something that will get my my attention straight away. C can you open up a little bit more like you mentioned there that it is important to understand your like customers and your ideal customers and speak directly to them. But how how did you get that one as part of the pro? You do some kind of customer research or uh, how how did you make sure that you are listening to your customers during this process? Yeah, so so there, that's a great question. Uh, and definitely you want to get some customer feedback on on what you're doing and, and what you're thinking of doing. So we did that in two ways. There's there's the ongoing way, and, and here there's a shameless product plug. We use Gong all the time. Every single customer call at Gong since 2016 is recorded, and we've been listening to those calls, and salespeople actually tag the marketing team when someone says something about the brand. Like, I remember being tagged on a call where, where a customer says, I don't understand why there's a bulldog on my login page. <laughs> so that, that's feedback, right? It's funny feedback, but it's feedback. And yeah. we've heard people say good things about the brand. We've heard people say things that they don't like about the brand. And we, we listened. And then, so, so that's the ongoing thing that we do. And then specifically for this rebranding project, we actually took early versions of especially the messaging more than the visuals. And we tested them with some members of our customer advisory forum. So it's a forum that meets regularly twice a year of a couple of dozen customers representing our different industries and uh, market segments. And we, we shared with them openly, we said, hey, would this appeal to you if we talked about this part of the value that we provide, or here's another option that we're thinking about, or maybe we're, we're completely wrong. And we took that feedback and we saw what was resonating, what wasn't resonating, because messaging is not an exact science. You can quantify part of it, but it's not an exact science. You can't measure everything. And having this qualitative discussion with customers is a great way of understanding if you're speaking the language of your customers. And when they go to a bar and someone asks them, oh, I heard you're using Gong, what, what value are you getting about it? You want to make sure you're using their words and not making up something that, that would be foreign to them. Yeah, exactly, exactly. When we are talking about like brand renewal, I, I think for a lot of different people, it means like so many different things. I, I think for a lot of people, it might be that hey, we got a new logo or we got a new website or we got a new value prop or whatever it is. But can, can you like walk us through the different things that you touch on your brand renewal process? Sure. So I think um, any good brand or visual identity process starts with first understanding who you are. And uh, one of the exercises that we always do uh, when, when we, we are making a big change in the rebrand is just trying to think of Gong as a person. Um, is this person old or young? Is this person conservative or crazy? Is this person um, like, who are the friends of this person? Are they wacky are they are they you know i don't know accountants uh who do they hang out with and and then you start thinking about the brand as a person and that really helps right because young or old is it like premium or is this for everyone um you start adding six or eight or ten of these attributes and then you can start imagining what gong would look and sound like as a person and that really helps you go to the next stage of describing it with colors, right? If, if Gong is a middle-aged business person in a suit, then maybe dark blues and whites and grays are a good choice for the website. But if Gong is a younger, helpful, approachable person, maybe pink and purple or yellow and green are a good choice for that. So these things really help. And when you start imagining, okay, what would the logo represent? So it has to capture the essence of the brand, right? Now, is it something that just blends in beautifully and doesn't disrupt anything and just feels comfortable? Uh, or is it something edgy that, that makes you even slightly uncomfortable and you want to learn more? Did you want to see some mystique there or do you want to just put it all out there and make it completely clear to everyone? These are the questions that, that come up. Um, a couple of interesting exercises we did at the beginning of, of this current branding project was uh, we showed our, our leadership team a long list of celebrities and we asked them which of them do you think could represent the Gong brand and which definitely not. So 
would Madonna be a good brand ambassador? How about Michael Jackson? Um, what about Stephen Colbert? Um, what about Sting? And it's interesting to see that there was a lot of agreement in the group of which celebrities could align with Gong's brand and which could not. And when we talked about it, we, we started uncovering like what values these people stand for, right? Some of these people, they're considered cutting edge, but also have a lot of integrity. And even, I don't know, Lady Gaga. I think Lady Gaga is a perfect brand ambassador for Gong because she's very edgy, she's very out there, but also she's all about social justice and human rights. And like, she hasn't been caught in any scandals and she, she she's very talented at what she does. She's doing at, that at the cutting edge, but, but she's also considered like really kind and approachable. Whereas other entertainers or, or not just entertainers are either too serious for us or maybe have been, you know, accused of things that, that don't fit with our brand. So, so that's, yeah. that's another fun exercise that, uh, that we did. But that's super, super interesting. I, I was <laughs> just starting to think like if we would do that one in advanced B2B, like what, what person I, I would be choosing and I, I don't know yet. So there's a little homework for me and little homework for it's a fun exercise. as well. Yeah, it's super, super interesting. When, when I was prepping for, for this episode, I, I went through your LinkedIn feed and one super interesting post I found there was where you mentioned that one really fun part of this rebranding process was getting to work with animators and music composers. So can, can you open up a little bit on this? Because I think this is something that not that many companies are actually doing maybe. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, we just lightly started touching on the sort of multi-sensory brand that I'm looking to build. But um, there's a great book by Martin Lindstrom uh, called Brand Sense. And uh, I, I remember reading it many years ago and also hearing Martin uh, speak live at a conference. And um, it left a lasting impression on me. And he talks about how great brands appeal to more than one sense. They don't just have a visual logo. Um, think of uh, opening a pack of crayons. It has a smell that you immediately identify. When you step into a new car in a car dealership, you smell that new car smell. And it's something that you can always smell, right? If, if I close your eyes, you would say, oh, that smells like a new car. Now, that's not how the car comes off the manufacturing plant. They have a spray that smells like new car and they spray the cars in the dealership with it to make them smell like new car because people want to own that. And if you think of the Nokia ringtone, da -na -na -na, da -na -na -na, da -na -na -na, you immediately recognize that even though like nobody's been using it for 20 years, uh, the Microsoft Start logo, remember that? The Microsoft Windows uh, 95, uh, yeah. they had that little tune that plays. So all of those things have become a part of their brand. Uh, a more recent one is the Netflix Tadam that comes up every time you, you open up Netflix. You don't have to see the screen to know that you're listening to Netflix. And those brands have become so strong. All the brands I just mentioned are really, really strong because they appeal to more than one sense. We know that visual is one of our five senses, but we can get so much more if you associate a sound and a smell and a touch to what your brand stands for. And so that's what I'm trying to do here at Gong. And I think B2C brands have been doing this for a while. In every Coca-Cola commercial, when they zoom in on the Coca-Cola, they'll stop the music so you can hear the tss that the carbonation is making. That's part of the brand. You associate that with Coca-Cola. Why, why don't more B2B brands do that? So that's what I'm trying to create here. And we, we did our first attempt with, with this rebrand and added a Sonic logo. So we went to a, to a musician in LA and we showed him and we told him what our brand is about. And we told him what we're trying to create here. And he presented different options to us and we started narrowing them down. And at some point we, we agreed that we would feel that this was a miss if we didn't include the, the sound that you expect from gong the musical instrument it's so obvious that you just you have to go there and then we we listen to other sonic brands like like netflix and others and we notice that if you jump straight into the punchline like if we would start the sonic logo with just hitting the gong 
a lot of people would miss it. And so you need a couple of seconds of preparing the ear to hear the big point. That's why when you're walking in an airport and there's a message, there's always that bell that rings like da da, and then they'll say the message because they're prepping your ear to listen to the main point. So if you listen to all the great Sonic logos, like the the Netflix Tadam or Gong's new logo, Sonic logo, it starts with a, a softer sound that builds up with a crescendo for a couple of seconds, and then it cuts to the punch of what I really want you to remember. So nobody remembers that that two seconds of building up because that's just made to, to capture your attention. But then the, the, the main point of the Sonic logo comes in. So this was a fascinating process. And uh, I think I think we landed on a good option uh, for our first try. Uh, I already have ideas and thoughts for, for how to improve it in the future. But, uh, but yeah, as soon as uh, we can make uh, the gong smell accessible to everyone over the web and, and the gong touch and feel, I want to do that too. That's super, super interesting. And thank you for sharing those examples. I, I really think that that helps people to understand that one better. And the smell thing is like, like super interesting as well. I actually, before moving to sales, I used to work as a chef. And wow. I've been always thinking like when there will be like, for example, you can watch MasterChef from the TV and you can get the smell to your home sofa as well. So I think that's super interesting as well, like how brands can have that feeling. And probably it won't take that long that we have something like that. Yeah, I mean, retail has been using it for a long time, right? If you, if you walk into a, 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 just any retail store, a lot of brands uh, like Hollister, they, they spray their perfume in the AC system so you can smell it. Uh, if you walk into a casino in Vegas, they, they have certain smells that they put in there to keep you in there for longer. It's pleasant. It's relaxing. Um, so retail understands this. Yeah, super interesting. But then if, if we think about the whole brand renewal process, there are like the design part and how things are like looking. And then I think like after the process is done, those are kind of things that are like easy to take to action. You can change your website, you can change your sales deck and those kind of thing. But can you open up a bit like how are you making sure that, for example, all your salespeople are bringing the right value of rub. Of course, you are using Gong for that one, but what, what other things you are are doing on that one to make sure that is happening? That, that's a great point, because uh, sometimes you see you know, companies where they're using a million different decks from a million different versions and, and slides, and everyone's creating their own. And it looks terrible. It looks unprofessional. Um, so the main thing we, we are doing, and we're working with our sales enablement team uh, that is helping us lead this within the sales team, we are first showing them the value of consistency of using the new brand. And by, by showing them like the calls that I mentioned uh, to you that started coming in where people are saying, oh, I saw your new brand. I wanted to talk to you because of that. That helps convince the salespeople that they should really be using the new brand because they're helping themselves sell more. And then, you know, you do that a lot and, and you make it easy. So our creative team worked for the last few months updating hundreds of presentations and pricing sheets and of course all the web pages and everything to leave almost nothing for the salespeople to do. We just updated everything. We put all their assets in the same links where they go looking for their presentations and now they find the new presentations there. So we're making it as easy as possible. And then if all of that doesn't work, also a little bit of shaming and threatening doesn't, doesn't hurt. I told them yesterday at the sales call, look, if I after this week, if I see anyone using an old deck, I will buy a billboard. I have the budget for this. I will put your name up there with the old deck and I will shame you in Union Square. So <laughs> don't do it. Um, and uh, of course, it's, it's a little bit of humor, but, but the idea is clear. First of all, show them the value of doing the right thing, then make it easy. And when you need a little reinforcement or tap someone on the shoulder, hey, I noticed you're not using the latest presentation. Was there something missing that you couldn't find that made you use the old one? Let's, let's help you solve this. Yeah, exactly. I, and I think like the value over there, that, that is the like most important point, because like if you just ask people to do something and they are not getting the value that they are getting out of that one, it, it might be really, really hard. So that's a very good point there. Uh, how many brand renewals you have done in your career before this one? Ooh, so I've done two at Gong now. So there's the, the big 2018 rebrand and there was now the 2021 rebrand. Um, I did a couple at 
a company called Panaya, where I was for five years. And I did at least two, I want to say, at a public company before that called Sarin Technologies um, that, uh, that, that sells to the diamond industry, technologies for uh, manufacturing diamonds and, and assessing diamonds. So uh, it's probably, I don't know, my fifth or sixth uh, rebrand project. They're always fun and interesting. It, 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 in all of them, there's also a lot of points of frustration where it looks like it's never going to come together and there's too many different opinions. But but it usually does come together. And uh, I'm, I mean, I'm happy to say that from time to time, I find like better and more professional partners to work on. And especially at Gong, it, it's it's probably the easiest place to do this because everyone starting from the CEO really get marketing and value marketing. So they trust us and they give us a lot of room for experimentation and freedom. And, and we partnered with great agencies and I think the, the result came out great. Yeah. Exactly, and for sure, a lot of lot of experience. But still, I think even though you have done it like many times in the past, there probably would be something that you maybe would be doing differently if you could start like this newest brand renewal over. So, what what would be something that if you had a chance to do it again that you would maybe do differently? Oh wow! Uh, I mean, we just launched last week. Uh, hopefully, I don't want to make big big changes, but. Um... Okay, here's one actually that I was discussing yesterday with our creative director, Lee. Um, our former brand used a lot of photography. Uh, we, we actually auditioned dozens of actors and uh, we auditioned seven dogs for the role of Bruno the dog, our mascot. True story. We auditioned <laughs> seven dogs for that role and Bruno the English bull bulldog got the role. This is... This is marketing. This is fun. I, I get to audition dogs. So we auditioned seven dogs for that role. And and he is the only character that carried over from the previous brand to this brand. And uh, we got rid of all the other actors and actresses that we we never used stock photos on our on our website before. We we commissioned all the photography from original actors and actresses. We we picked their clothes, their shoes, and their their props and everything. And this brand, we decided to take a different direction. And we, we partnered with a design studio in Portugal that did dozens of illustrations for the website. If you go to our website, you'll see that uh, there's maybe just one or two photos on it and everything else is illustration. And I absolutely love, and all the feedback we've been getting, people love the new style of illustration. It's very unique. It's very gong. It's colorful. It shows a lot of diversity, and it's just—it's a lot of fun, but still looks very professional and enterprisey. It doesn't look like you know some someone's kid made it in the garage, and so that's something that I'm looking forward to continuing to develop. And uh, we were just discussing yesterday how quickly can we replace the one or two photographs that we have left on the website with that style of illustration because I think it, it's really uniquely ours and is going to serve us well. Um, you know, another area that we in the same area, but that we did not develop enough is we're going to have to use photography in cases like when we're showing speakers of a conference or something. How do we want to treat that to make that look like it belongs to the Gong brand? We didn't really finish that part of the rebrand project thinking about uh, photography treatment all the way, but we're, we're going to do it as a follow up. I mean, as I said, branding is, is a never ending project. It's always evolving. And uh, if you can continue waiting another month or three months or three years before launching and we'd still not be completely finished. So at some point you've just got to say, you know, what we have is good enough. It looks great. It's a huge improvement on what we had before. Let's launch this and continue iterating once it's up in the air. Yeah, exactly. Good, good points there. But how about if we look this question from an, like another perspective? So let's say that there is something on the like, brand itself that you are like super happy with for example the logo or the website or the messaging uh, would there be something like in the process of making those that you would be like changing for example doing something in a different order like when doing the rebranding right. process or something like that uh good point um i think i think if we were to do this again, I would want to discuss things like the website hierarchy and navigation much earlier than we did because we, yeah. we overlooked a few things that we're now going to correct in that area. So that's something I would have done earlier. And, and, and more generally around the website, when, when people 
see a, a new rebrand project, they usually go to the website first. So, but that's just one one component. It's a big component, but one component of the new system. Um, I think we would have uh, strived to lock all of the copy on the website much earlier than we actually did. We were literally making changes on the morning of the launch to some <laughs> headlines and things like that. That uh, I hate that sort of scrambling. And I, I think great marketing teams should not have to do a lot of scrambling like that because the, the, the rebrand date did not catch us by surprise. We, we knew months before that we're going to be launching on that day. So uh, yeah. I would have uh, pushed for, for earlier lock on the website copy. Yeah, exactly. exactly. But then one that everyone is always interested is the money part. Uh, could you open up a little bit? Like, how did you uh, use the money in the process? For example, when, when you started budgeting for this rebranding process, was it like clear for you how much you should be asking from for for this kind of? And then the other, like, how are you making? measuring the return on investment in something like this. Right. So so to to divide the question into two parts, you know, you can do you can do a rebrand project for for $10,000 and for $10 million and anything within that range. Um, talking to other CMOs at companies in similar stages like Gong, I think most rebrand project these days for a series B C D E company costs something between 150 to 350 thousand dollars that's probably the price you're going to pay if you want to get really professional uh, visual design and uh, some help with the messaging and copy so uh, we, we fell into that range so that that was also the budget that I had anticipated last year and put it in this year's budget so it was it was not a challenge getting it done. I mean, yes, if you're a, a seed or round a company, that might be a lot and you probably have to find uh, a, a more cost effective option to begin with. But uh, for companies our stage, you, you should be ready to spend a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Um, I mean, it looks good for a reason. It's it's not just, you know, yeah. <laughs> one freelance designer that you offshore the work to. It's, it's a team of professionals that are working on the strategy and then the messaging and then the visual design. Um, and if you want to go sonic design and animation, that costs extra, of course. So yeah. that, that was the range. You know, we're, we're not looking to measure direct ROI on the new brand. Um, this is part of, as I said, catching the brand up to where the company is and where the company is going. And it's one of those things that's just clear that you have to do. You know, just like if you're working in an office, it's clear that you have to give the employees lunch. You're not looking for ROI on that lunch, right? You just know you have to do it because you have to feed your employees. So yeah. updating your brand to where the company is, in, in my mind, and I think in our leadership minds, is just something that we have to do. Nobody's asking to see a dashboard of what the ROI on that branding process is. Uh, we are seeing sort of the softer side of ROI, like anecdotes of calls coming in. The people mention the brand and what they like about it, what they don't like about it, or how it um, actually triggered their request to talk to us, but uh, we're not looking to measure the direct ROI on this. It's just part of what we have to do, part of the cost of doing business. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You, you mentioned earlier uh, that you came up with this category called revenue intelligence, but can, can you open up like, did you think about creating a new category now when you, where you were doing the rebranding or how did you thought about the category part here in this process? Yeah, so so a couple of years ago, we we were in a position where we we were within a category for about three years that was called conversation intelligence, and uh, we felt that similar to the brand process that we just went through, we had outgrown that category for for a couple of reasons. One, conversation intelligence is sort of the underlying technology that can take calls and analyze them and understand what happens. Um, and initially, that was most of what the product did. But after three years, the product did so much more than that. And the other companies in our space had a very narrow vision of what conversation intelligence is, that we were looking to solve two problems. One, position ourselves in a different league. We had a deeper, much, forward, much more forward-looking product vision for what we wanted to do. And the other players um, just made everything seem so much smaller in conversation intelligence. And we thought it would be easier to differentiate ourselves if we picked a different category and said, well, we're not playing in the little kiddies pool. We're doing something much, much bigger now. And the second thing is that 
we are selling mostly to sales leaders and to get and keep their attention, we need to talk about something that they care about. And when we talked to some senior sales leaders, and back then we were talking about conversation intelligence, it sounded like a very tactical tool to them. And they said, okay, go talk to someone in sales enablement. But we figured that if we change that, and it sounds like a subtle change from conversation intelligence to revenue intelligence, we could talk to the CRO or to the VP of sales because they care about revenue. They can't knock this down. And we actually made a lot of progress on both of those challenges. We're now talking to a lot more senior leaders and everyone realizes that Gong is the category leader of what we do. And we've left the smaller competitors way, way, way behind us because we differentiated ourselves and positioned ourselves in this new category of revenue intelligence. So that, that really helped us solve both of the problems we're looking to solve for. Yeah, great. Thank you for sharing that one. And then lastly, in every episode, I have this part in the end where I have a question for my previous guest to you. And then you have a chance to ask a question to my next guest. And on my last, last episode, I had Michael Hansen joining me and we discussed uh, like sales outbound cadences. And Michael's question for you was, how do you get your people to be so active on LinkedIn? And this is something that I think a lot of people are uh, raving to know the answer for. So what do you do? How do you do? Awesome. That? Yeah, I, I get this question a lot. People ask us, do you have some secret technology that allows you to control everyone's LinkedIn profiles? Because like, you, it's not uncommon to see 500 gongsters share a piece of content or how excited they are about our new brand. There is no magic. There is no technology behind this. There's, there's two things that we do. One of them, we show them what's in it for them, right? When I, every month I give a talk to the new gongsters, we have about 50 new gongsters join every month. I give them a talk during their onboarding and I show them how our social strategy works. And I tell them, look, you know, all of your leads are on LinkedIn. They're selling to sales professionals. They're on LinkedIn. Now the LinkedIn algorithm works in a way that when it sees that an article is shared within the first hour by a hundred people, it's probably an interesting piece of content and they want to keep people on the platform for longer so that they'll, they'll make that piece of content more visible to other people like you, other sales people. And when they do that, we can capture those people and bring them back to you as sales opportunities. So when we tell you, or when we ask you, please share this piece of content and you comment and share and like it, you're helping tell the LinkedIn algorithm to show this to more sales professionals. And then we do our magic and bring those leads back to you as opportunities. So you're really helping us help yourself. So once the salespeople understand what's in it for them, they're really happy to help because they want to help themselves. They want to get more sales opportunities. So that's, that's the big part. The other part is, you know, this is not, um, isolated from our ongoing relationship with the sales team. And we have a really good relationship with the sales team. We, we have a marketing Slack channel where any salesperson can come in and ask a question or ask for an asset or, or make a request. And every time they do that, they'll get a response within minutes from someone from the marketing team who's pointing them to where to find what they're looking for or thanking them for a great idea and telling them when we'll be ready to work on it. And you've got to create that relationship of trust. You can't just be asking salespeople to do stuff for you, but not listen to their requests when they need things. So I think that plus showing them what's in it for them, that's that's the magic. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that one and came back to the value again. So I think that's a great learning from this, this discussion. And then lastly, on my next episode, I am interviewing Richard Harris. And I think you might have something interesting to him because with Richard, we are discussing on how to ask better questions in your sales process. And for sure, you at Gong, you had a lot of data on good questions and what kind of questions people should be asking in the sales. But what do you think? What I should be asking from Richard? Richard is fantastic. And, and we, we've partnered with him uh, in the past. I think... Um... I think it would be interesting to ask him, what are some good landmine questions to ask a prospect to overcome an objection? Because sometimes you'll get objections where they say, I don't have budget for this, or I'm not the right person, or I, I, I don't see a need for this. And then I think Richard might have some great ideas for some landmine questions 
that you can plant there and that would turn around that objection into, into interest in your product. So I'd love to hear his perspective on that. Yeah, great. Thank you for that one. I will be asking that one from Richard in the next episode. At this point, super big thank you for joining this episode and thanks for all the listeners. And if you liked the episode, feel free to share it on your social and tag me and Uri on that one. And have a great day, everyone. And bye-bye. Thanks for having me, Sam. Thanks for watching, everyone.